This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks, Brent. Good morning, everyone. My prestigious panel members are welcome to make their way to the stage. Can the rest of us come down as well? <laughs> Um, as sort of Steve highlighted, don't quit your job and, and expect to look for another one. Um, for many um, New York State producers, processors, uh, the same uh, tactic goes along in defining and keeping uh, markets for your products. Uh, and so the panel that we assembled today uh, is looking at uh, market access continued or expanded market access for New York uh, producers and processors from both some local and long distance dimensions. I think we all realize the uh, increase in attention and interest in local regional foods development, for example, the uh, expanded interest in consumers making a connection to where their food comes from to understand uh, how it got from where it originated to where it is. Um, and we brought and assembled some speakers today that are going to address those types of issues. Um, in addition, uh, issues of sustainability, uh, environmental implications um, continue to be on the forefront. And there exists uh, the growth in technologies, particularly distribution technologies that we're going to focus on this morning, uh, that sort of address those environmental issues carbon footprint and things like that. So we can look at these areas from both dimensions, and, and we will. Um, and then also, uh, we are delighted to have uh, Pat Hooker, the Commissioner of Agriculture here today, to talk about sort of the state policy development and strategies uh, and their efforts in addressing these types of issues. I'll address the uh, panel members as they come up. Um, I have to uh, apologize. I talked with Paul Esposito, the uh, senior VP from RailX, um, this morning um, as he made his way from one room to the phone, uh, is unfortunately under the weather uh, and was unable to make it. So um, I'm going to try to fill in for Paul in talking about um, the RailX platform uh, that is involved in uh, express train deliveries across the coast in terms of refrigerated perishable product deliveries. So um, bear with me, I could not do as good a job with uh, this as Paul could, um, but I do um, fortunately have um, some slides that he had put together uh, and he certainly expresses his uh, uh, Appreciation for being invited and unfortunately couldn't make it. Okay. <laughs> Just come back. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with um, the RailX operation. It is relatively in its infancy, started a few years ago, um, headquartered on this end in Rotterdam, New York. Um, it features uh, three refrigerated mega transload distribution centers. Uh, one uh, most recently opened in Delano, California. Originally, the hubs were in Wallula, Washington and uh, Rotterdam, New York. Uh, the coast to coast distribution centers run a scheduled weekly five day service, 55 uh, car uh, refrigerated unit train, uh, capacity to transport the equivalent of 220 truckloads of refrigerated merchandise each and every week, both ways. Uh, so one of the reasons we were bringing uh, Paul and RailX in is to talk about these new opportunities uh, that producers, processors, and agribusiness firms can think about in terms of how can we attract new markets in a way of utilizing this technology. All right. Um, I'm not going to go through all of Paul's slide, but I just wanted to show a little bit to give you guys a flavor of it. Uh, it back in uh, last March, I had a group uh, organized an agribusiness tour of the RailX facility. Perhaps some of you were there. Uh, it's a pretty impressive facility. This is um, on the uh, back end in 
um, Washington State, the facility there. Um, much of what they talk about in terms of not only transportation uh, across the, uh, the coast, but is its proximity on both ends to uh, sizable consumer market populations, obviously New York City, the Boston-Washington corridor on this end, but also uh, proximity to some large markets on the West Coast that um, as New York producers and processors can think about uh, ways to attract those uh, markets for our products. This is the uh, Railex facility in Rotterdam, um, right there, uh, with the unit train coming in here. It's a very impressive facility. I'll show some pictures on the inside. And again, talking about, at least from the perspective back there, is the proximity to the, to the major markets in the Northeast, something that we've uh, uh, worked on and is our direct attention. Um, for a long time. Our proximity to markets provides us with an opportunity. Those notwithstanding, those are opportunities for others as well, and so we need to continue to think about what is our competitive advantage for our products in the Northeast, as well as in other areas to expand our market areas. Um, October was their Delano facility that opened up in California. Uh, and again, uh, proximity to some major markets. Um, on both ends, uh, indoor refrigerated loading and unloading uh, facilities. Um, so the original train that's been running uh, has been from Wallalula to, to Rotterdam, uh, both ways. Uh, there is room on that train going this way. Uh, and it's one of the things that uh, RailX has been trying to work with agencies, uh, farmer groups and things to talk about what types of, of products should we be thinking about moving there, what are ways to attract buyers and market our products on the West Coast. One of the things that um, they uh, market in terms of their products and in terms of, 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 of some of these consumer uh, demand issues is uh, the fact that one of their focuses is on getting truck traffic off, off the road and, tr and improving uh, environmental em emissions. They also have um, very detailed, complex um, monitoring systems for product traceability. Again, another uh, major issue on uh, the consumer uh, forefront today in terms of food safety. Uh, GPS monitored temperature control cars as a customer. Um, you can log in once your product gets on that train. You can log in on their website, find out what the temperature is in the car, or where it is exactly uh, updated uh, in real time. This is just a picture of some of the of, of the um, the rail cars that they utilize. These were are actually uh, designed. Uh, with RailX and the railroads owned by the railroads and then leased to the RailX facility. GPS monitoring, I mentioned this is, I know you can't read it, but this is just uh, uh, a readout of, of tracking all the different products on a particular car in a particular location, on a particular pallet uh, as we go along across the country. So they are very, um, have been very uh, successful in, in their transit times. Uh, in getting the products t to their destinations when they needed them to be. Uh, they have some preferential um, scheduling with the railway to get that five-day guaranteed service across the country. Um, security as well. Um, they have a, a particular racking system that allows them to, um, you know, take advantage of the capacity in these cars at the same time uh, preserving the quality of the products. I'm not a packager, so I won't explain it. So this was the facility, again, that opened up in Delano uh, more recently. Uh, but in terms of some of their expansion plans, which I think, again, as sort of a New York agribusiness community, we can, we can think about, uh, there are plans in terms of, uh, of reaching this market in the southeast, in Florida, as well as in Tennessee. And it didn't show it there, but there's some some rail issues, but also the linkage from uh, the Rotterdam facility down into uh, the southeast area of the country. Uh, they do um, 
were awarded uh, the Smartway Transport Partner in 2007 with respect to their environmental contributions in reducing um, emissions and fuel use. Um, and, and, they, and they utilize that a lot in their, in their marketing campaign. Um, and again, again uh, the environmentally friendly attribute is something they, they tout very well uh, as well. So Paul could have given you a much uh, more dynamic presentation than that, but I wanted to at least um, mention this uh, and, and briefly describe the RailX facility. They currently have been very active in working with New York um, agricultural trade associations and producer groups in thinking about ways to uh, utilize these facilities um, going west, obviously. Um, and they have, we organized a tour in March, as I said, um, and they're very interested in doing that. I, I encourage you um, to think about this in terms of, of back to your organization in, in ways of thinking about the opportunities in more distant markets that we can attract and take advantage of the technology. Um, I had uh, spoken with Paul uh, a couple of months ago, and I was, I was very interested. It was, it was the end of October. It was around uh, Halloween time, and um, I think I can say this without Paul getting upset at me, but I was wondering what the, what the product flows and stuff were coming in, and they had been shipping some fruits and vegetables and tree stock uh, west, but there's definitely uh, available space on this train going west and I was very surprised to learn what new what products a new product that was coming in from the west to the east and I don't mean to upset in any local New York producers but what was coming in was pumpkins which was sort of a surprise to me we do tend to grow a lot of pumpkins in New York but it wasn't just any pumpkins okay it was small pumpkins with the painted faces you know what I'm talking about you see them in the store they aren't carved they're just the little ones with the painted faces a very specific market that a lot of different stores, grocery stores and stuff, might be selling as part of their products. But it just identifies that there's, you know, we can do that. I mean, I have the anticipation that um, our local producers and stuff can take advantage of those markets, and maybe they're not. So um, in some ways, this can be sort of an eye-opener. Uh, but I think there are opportunities here both to do a better job of marketing our products uh, in our own uh, Northeast uh, markets, but also think about ways in the same way that a red delicious apple from Washington State is not the same apple as a Cortland uh, from New York, there are distinct advantages and differences in those product characteristics that my guess uh, consumers would be willing to um, pay for in other areas of the country. So um, this is my highlight of RailX and, to think of, and just to get you thinking about some of the opportunities for marketing our products in more long distance dimensions. I think what I'm going to do now is I'll just hold for some questions at the end, but I'll um, bring our next panel speaker up, uh, unless there's an impending question right now that I can answer quickly. Um, what I'd like to do now is move to some more of the, the local dimensions of market access. And we have the privilege today to have Sam si Dr. Sam Simon, uh, the president of Hudson Valley Fresh, here with us. Um, Sam was born and raised on a dairy farm in, in Middletown, New York. Uh, both his father and grandfather were cattle dealers. Uh, he attended the University of Rochester for undergraduate and graduated in 68. He graduated in 72 from St. Louis University uh, Medical School and from the University of Pittsburgh in orthopedics in 77. He moved to Poughkeepsie and started solo practice that same year. Um, and Sam has continued to farm the home farm in Middleton until the mid-90s, at which time he purchased the Plank and Horn Dairy Farm uh, in Pleasant Valley. Uh, he has since retired from orthopedics in 98 and started a milking dairy in 99. 2004 was when Hudson Valley Fresh was founded. Um, and not to take any, any talking points away from Sam, um, for those of you that don't know, Hudson Valley Fresh is a uh, nonprofit dairy co-op dedicated to showcasing the local agri agricultural products, particularly high quality value added fluid milk products in the Hudson Valley, as well as producing a living wage for their farmer members. 
In addition to the members uh, of Hudson Valley Fresh, they also take advantage of alternative membership levels that brings in retailers, schools, institutions, restaurants, and others uh, as part of that overall operation. To put a little bit in perspective, when founded in 2004, uh, they're originally marketing their products in Dutchess County. Uh, today, Hudson Valley Fresh has now extended its market area to include Orange, Ulster, New York City, Westchester, and Long Island um, in the city area. Certainly a success story that, uh, that um, Dr. Simon will talk about in terms of the mission and underlying um, philosophies of this operation in ways that it has led to improved market access for their product. Dr. Simon? Thank you very much, uh, Todd, and thanks for inviting me. And hopefully my personal experience with Hudson Valley Fresh will serve as some intellectual capital for others who may be thinking along the same line. The purpose, uh, and I will roll back to about year 2000, 2001, when I uh, started the dairy up again, and I've been milking cows for 50 years, um, for those who don't know. Uh, now I don't milk them every day. Now I do mostly the crop and uh, have a, do have an excellent herdsman. However, when I bought the second herd in 98, the price of milk in December was $17. The price of milk in June was $13 and going down. And over the subsequent year or two, the price was, I would say, terrible. When it costs $18.60 to make 100 pounds of milk in our area, and you're receiving $14, there's only a matter of a certain number of years left before everybody's out of business and dairy farming will be just a dinner conversation. My herdsman was Tom Manning and one day I said to him, I have the luxury of being an orthopedic surgeon that's retired who has a reserve of funds to subsidize my passion and provide you a fair wage. I said, but this is history. We're 23 farms and there were 323 farms when I moved to Dutchess County in the 70s. One day, he's going to a baseball game with his first cousin, who I'd never met, and his name is Pat Manning. And, he tells, and Pat Manning tells him that he was called by his constituents, which were Northern Dutchess and Columbia County, that things are getting very bleak, and we got to do something. So Tom offers me to talk to Pat. So Pat visits the farm. And I said, oh, yeah, let's go to lunch at the Pleasant Valley Diner. And you know, we sit, and he says, what do you think? I said, well, you know what I think? I think it's time for the farmers to stand up for themselves and realize we have a value-added product in milk. And why do you say that? I said, I get these awards for quality from Agamark, and they get, and they, I don't know if they were at that time yet, but they're giving me 0.3 cents a pound for the value added. That's an insult. But I'm not the only farmer around here who gets this. 30 cents a hundredweight extra. I said, we need to take those, that milk, segregate it, bottle it as Hudson Valley Fresh, and educate the consumer that all milk is not created equal. And perhaps for that extra effort, you can get a fair price. So the mission was get $20 a hundredweight for what's bottled, save the farms, save the open space by keeping the steward on the land, use a small footprint, a carbon footprint, and get it bottled nearby. All well said and done, you know. Unfortunately, we've been raised to realize milk is a commodity. The price is dictated by the price of cheese or, or butter in Chicago, so we have no control. But there are certain things that can't be debated. The quality of milk affects the taste. The freshness affects the taste. The public does not desire to have RBST in, used on, their, on the cows that produce the milk. I'm not going to debate the issue of RBST because there are brilliant people on both sides of the issue. And there's no question that 
the importance of local, local, local in a small carbon footprint is significant because if milk can leave my barn, be in the processing plant in 30 minutes, processed and on a truck that same day, I dare say, even though the California cows are friendly, their milk can't be here that quick, okay? And the reality is that we consume in the Northeast from Vermont to Maryland 40% of dairy, but we only produce 15% of the dairy. Now, there's something wrong with this picture. So, in essence, Hudson Valley Fresh was created to obtain more money for the local farmers who are willing to meet the quality standards. What are those standards? As you see from the slide, these standards are met by 30% of our Agrimark members. And I belong to the big co-op Agrimark, which everybody knows owns cabbage cheese. Every one of those farmers, which we are now eight in Hudson Valley Fresh, reach these guidelines day in, day out. No question, there can be a month where you get a spike because you have a couple cows giving you an aggravation. But the reality, this is a, a doable thing. But how do you segregate? And how do you get it bottled, segregated? And I did go to numerous places, plants, said, we bottle your milk, no problem. It's called co-packaged. We'll bottle it with your label on it. I said, that's not the plan. The plan is truly to bottle that milk segregated, not commingled. And what are the benefits? Pride in the product that's not commingled, a fair price, milk fewer cows have a better quality of life. The problem is the farmers are working themselves to death because they can't afford help and there's no way out. I spent about three days driving through New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia with three other farmers looking at ways of creating a processing plant if we could not get packaged in, in a plant, you know, non-commingled. And I quickly realized that of the five, six plants we visited, within 24 months of visiting them, they were bankrupt. It was easy to get the grant to build the plant. It was easy to raise or mortgage something, but it was the cash flow that was the issue and they couldn't cash flow it. So let's not reinvent the wheel and the farmers don't need any help in losing money. We can do that without getting involved in another project. So I said, we need to find some place that would benefit from our presence, from our product, that we can invest and perhaps help them. There was one small plant in Pine Plains that had been, to their benefit, credit, working for about 10, 12 years at the time, bottling their own family milk, dumping about a third of it, that's still after 10 years, but selling it in New York under the Ronnie Brook label. I approached them about potential bottling our milk, not commingled, and let us pick it up and deliver it. That could be done, however, we'd have to invest in certain items in the plant. My mission on this whole project was no debt. I'd have to raise some money. I'd have to put in some personal money but I wasn't going to go in debt. We had to also educate the consumer. Is this a value to them? Do they want to purchase it and why? Do you get, you preserve open space, you get something fresh. We also had to re-educate the farmer that the consumer is our friend, not the company or the trailer that picks up the milk and the importance of a well-kept farm. This costs more money. How do we create this entity? Do we go for profit or do we go non for profit? As I said, I needed to raise some money. Patrick Manning was very helpful in guiding us and getting us a constituent grant from the USDA. Uh, all told, it was about $25,000. We decided to go non for profit, which required getting, developing bylaws, rules, creating a business plan. Much of that was a bit novel to me. What we engaged, the Dutchess County Cooperative Extension, and the grants we received were initially spent in them providing us administrative help. We created a non-for-profit, then the discussion of building a plant or subcontracting was easily dismissed because of the cost and the potential for loss, and we subcontracted with Ronnie Brook after we invested to put in our own tanks, our own washer, own labelers, 
so that our milk came in separate, was processed, and could leave. We asked, also had to realize, where are we going to sell this milk? We had to know where the demographics, who, if we're going to charge $20 or give $20 to the farmer for the milk that's in the bottle, obviously that milk on the shelf is going to cost more than generic milk if the, if the big producers are paying the farmers $14. So right away we're 30% higher, even if, if we're as efficient as the big players. So we knew the cost of processing because they had given us a charge. We had to buy, purchase all the bottles, the labels, et cetera. And based on that, I decided what the cost of the product would be to us and what we'd have to charge the consumer or the stores. How are we going to promote this brand? How are we going to educate the consumer? Who's going to be our best advocate? Whoever that was, he had to be very passionate. He had to be known in the community. You had to get some press, or some identif identifying uh, symbol. So we had to create a logo, which you see in the upper right hand corner. You need an artist. Again, this is very expensive. But there are many people in that area who, who want to promote open space and think that's important. And lo and behold, a graphic artist approached me and said, I want to help you. I said, great. What are you going to call yourself? I said, Hudson Valley Fresh. We used to have Hudson Valley Harvest, but you don't harvest milk. How about Hudson Valley Fresh? And that can include both vegetables, fruits, and uh, milk. So he created the logo for the same price that I received for my time, pro bono. And having the logo, having local congressmen like Pat Manning promoting us, but also having business people or the chamber promoting us was very helpful. For an example, one day driving to the farm on the radio, I heard Charlie North, president of the Poughkeepsie Chamber, say, singing a uh, jingle, think local first. When you shop, when you dine, when you work online, buy online, think local first. I said, well, that's what we're all about. So I call Charlie North up and I say, Charlie, this is our problem. This is what we want to promote. Can you help us? He said, well, let me come out to the farm, which will be his first visit. Of course, comes out in a silk suit and fancy leather shoes. And first place I take him is to the barn so he can have appreciation of what we're dealing with and taste some chocolate milk. And he said, you know, this is around Christmas time. We're going to have a big uh, breakfast, which we have monthly, but we're going to be featuring the students who have won awards. How about we raffle off a bottle of milk? I said, well, how many people are coming? He said, about 300. That's about 30 tables. I said, how about I bring 30 half gallons of chocolate milk? How about that? He said, oh, that'd be tremendous. So we walk into the breakfast, and there are 300 businessmen plus the students there. The chocolate milk is in a champagne carafe, and he makes a toast to Hudson Valley Fresh. We are already in a few little stores and Adams and some delis. After that one promotion, the sales just spiked. And it was just his advocating for this and him repeating Hudson Valley Fresh on the radio, which all of a sudden got the word out that we are an entity to be reckoned with, that we are truly local, and the importance of supporting a local product. Our funds really came from two prime, three sources. Grants, Department of Agriculture, a constituent grant from uh, Patrick Manning, some personal private funding, and then we asked the farmers to participate in a minimal way because we realized how pushed and stressed they were. They each participated by $500 per year for three years. All told, we raised about $100,000, and that was truly our seed money to buy a refrigerated truck and, and pay for the administrative costs at the, the Cooperative Extension. Our track record from growth, the first week, where literally for the first four months I was delivering the milk in the coolers uh, to the six family-owned stores. In a year and a half, we were in 70 stores, including Stop and Shop, Hannaford's, Fresh Town, Price Chopper. And subsequently, they expanded into New York City Included here are uh, Whole Foods, which represent nine stores. And now we also have been approved for 13 in northern New Jersey.
This sort of reflects our growth by week and by month, uh, and this is really our three-year history. And like with any growth, there's pain. Pain in that there's a big demand, you need to meet it. If you want the freshness, you want the quality. And processing ability is always critical. We at this point have uh, moved into a bigger facility only because of the amount of milk we need to push through the plant. Uh, our source of milk is still good. We have eight farms representing 1.7 million pounds a month of milk. We by no means use all of that. Employees that are committed to the mission, we have four part-time drivers, we have two refrigerated trucks that deliver all our milk locally. It was important for us and for me specifically that we had control of this perishable item. It leaves the farm and is in the local stores within 36 hours. Anything that goes to New York City goes to a distributor, but he buys it directly from us and then distributes it with his add-on cost to New York. It's a, it would be a nightmare for us to consider moving milk and distributing down that distance. But he also has been able to open up some doors in the large chains for us. The whole, mil whole milk uh, chain really was to uh, an effort on my part and he, and that's just fortuitous. The Vice President of Whole Foods happened to have a summer home in Hyde Park, New York, drove by the farm said, you know, I buy your milk in Amish stores. It's very good. What's this all about? I told him the story, and he said, you know, this product belongs in our store. Not, he was unaware that for the past year and a half I've been calling, trying to get an appointment. It never happened. <laughs> he happened to drive by the farm and saw the guy painting my side of my barn. He needed a painter in his home. And it was like, what do you call it? This, forget the word, but it's all meant to be. Uh, interesting. Um, so that's, you know, and how do you keep promoting the product? How do you create public awareness? All these items listed here are, are expensive. Uh, newspaper ads, you know what they cost. Radio is expensive, but if it's an infomercial, then it's somewhat helpful. Billboards, we, we do have a couple of billboards, $600 a month, but it creates public awareness and location is critical. The most valuable is taste testing. My wife and I have done dozens of taste testings in different grocery stores, Whole Foods, New York. Other farmers, part of the project, have done that as well. Why is that critical? Let the consumer put it to their lips. Let the consumer meet the farmer. The story is over. They take the bottle off the shelf and do this because they identify with it. They realize it's real and then you have a loyal customer. You have to pro provide a product that's consistently good and on the shelf. And as we know, milk is perishable and how it's handled is so critical. And some stores call me the thermometer man because locally, if there's an issue, they know who to call. And I get an issue in six different stores. I say, what's going on? And sure enough, I go with my thermometer to the store and I pull a shelf off with the dairy, I pull a bottle off the shelf with the dairy manager. I said, I'm gonna buy this, but let's open it here and I put the thermometer in and it reads 46 degrees. How long is milk gonna last at 46 degrees on the shelf? We all know it has to be under 40 degrees. So he says to me, why don't you take the milk to one level below? It's 48 degrees further from the cooler. But that is often an issue of shelf life. This product is uh, pasteurized for 20 seconds, not ultra pasteurized. And the reason we do that, we want to preserve the flavor. We want, we want whole milk to be whole milk. The, milk. the product that we sell in the store is literally whole milk, what the cows are giving. We do not standardize to 3.2%. We give the full fat. The chocolate milk is the same. The low fat is 1% and skim is skim. We also sell a half and half and heavy cream that's 40 percent. But as we all know, it all sounds good and tastes well if it's right coming out of the factory, but if it's not handled properly, the only thing they'll remember is that Hudson Valley Fresh logo. And that, you know, good news travels, but bad news travels faster.
This is sort of a reflection of our sales, uh, sort of a glimpse in the past two years. You know, we started at the end of 06, um, correction, end of 05. And uh, so it's 06, 07, 08 are the three full years. And the last month we were sales was $60,000. 25% uh, of that is in New York City. The remainder is local. The blue dots represent the farms. The red dots represent the stores in our area. And then we drive to Fishkill and uh, at this point taking up anywhere between 150 and 200 cases per week straight to New York. And that usually is process, we process two days a week, Mondays and Thursdays. And Monday night it's at the, at the distributor. Tuesday, Tuesday morning it's in New York City. Wednesday morning they deliver as well. And then Thursday's delivery goes Friday morning and Saturday morning. I guess that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Simon. Um, we'll have both uh, Dr. Simon and Commissioner Hooker up here afterwards for some more questions. Uh, but before, before we do that, um, what we'd like to do now is, is look at these issues from um, the policy development state side of things, strategies for improving uh, access for local agricultural products. And for that, um, we are very excited to have Patrick Hooker here with us. Um, he's uh, New York State's 26th Agricultural Commissioner. And as commissioner, his responsibility to ensure uh, that agriculture remains a significant contributor to New York's economy and quality of life. Uh, a graduate of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, Commissioner Hooker uh, came to the department with a wealth of knowledge, experience, and passion for the state's agricultural industry. He worked for the New York Farm Bureau for 16 years as the organization's top lobbyist, serving as the director of its public policy division. Commissioner Hooker has made revitalizing the state's rural and agricultural economy a priority for his administration. That included $30 million in emergency funding in 07 for the state's struggling dairy farmers, and a record $34 million in state funding for farmland protection programs. Commissioner Hooker also serves as the chairman of the State Council on Food Policy, the new advisory uh, body created to address, uh, address the broad spectrum of food challenges facing our state, uh, from protecting farmland to improving the nutrition of our school children and senior citizens. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce State Agricultural Commissioner Patrick Hooker. Well, I see we still have a few folks in the room, so not all of you have heard me speak before, obviously. I did notice that the students all left when the PowerPoint came up. They saw that it was a hooker PowerPoint, and, uh, but then they saw these slides and they decided to check out. It's altogether possible that we've, um, that we've reached the, uh, the peak of the morning and that we're gonna go downhill between now and lunch, so I appreciate all of you hanging in here with me. And I thought, though, that I really enjoyed the morning. And I'm sure that all of you did too. I, I think um, I was taking some notes and I just thought it was important to clarify a couple of things. Talked a lot about government this morning and, and how we may all interact and although that's not exactly the subject of, of what I'm gonna talk about, I, I thought it was important to sort of follow up on a couple of thoughts that Dr. Kyle had, maybe put some context out, out there for people. First of all, one of the things that he said, we all have our own takeaways, but these are just mine here quickly. Uh, he said, if the U.S. Treasury fails, we all want to have a shotgun so that we could go deer hunting. Although he wasn't promoting or discouraging deer hunting, I can tell you that now all the fruit and vegetable growers here in the audience uh, hope that the U.S. Treasury fails because after immigration, uh, wildlife damage is number one for them. So 
So I want to uh, pass that along for him. Thanks a lot. Um, he talked about uh, he talked about the uh, all the trends, and we could clearly see the uh, the cliffs as as he described them. Uh, after lunch, I'm going to be up in the animal science department talking about the the state's finances and where we are. And I can tell you that the slides he showed you look a lot more like the rolling hills of the Finger Lakes compared to the state finances these days. It's uh, stark and, and dramatic times. I think we really are dealing with, uh, with a cliff. He also said, be thankful that you have a job. And <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> I've had this job for less than two years and we are now on our second governor and our third chief of staff. So I, uh, I am very grateful. Uh, we are all thanking for the same thing in my whole household for this Christmas. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, the other thing that I was grateful that he put in his slide was that um, we should pr put more aid to state government, which hopefully has an effect on the be happy you have a job. So um, wrapping up just a little bit, uh, Todd, great, great uh, stepping in there quickly. And I just thought I would, uh, I, I thought I should clarify a couple things. First of all, I uh, mentioned Red Delicious, which Red Delicious is that here in New York State. Red Delicious from Washington is an oxymoron. And I also thought that I should mention that um, there's absolutely, uh, it's a vicious rumor that that was a lead-based uh, melamine-infected paint on those uh, pumpkins from China <laughs> that came into our market. That's a vicious rumor. Please capture that accurately. And. Uh, and doctor, I, I just love what you're doing down there. It's very interesting. Um, I have the shirt. <laughs> and I think the word you may have been looking for that they use here on the campus is serendipity. Uh, on my road, they call it being lucky rather than, rather than good. <laughs> so uh, with that, maybe I should press on and do something more substantive. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank my staff who are here. Uh, uh, and Ann McMahon, first of all, I want you to raise your hand so people can see. Ann heads up uh, the staff work on the Council on Food Policy. And when you see all the people who are on this, you're really going to see that uh, we are herding cats here. It's a fun business, but Ann, you do it very well. So people have uh, questions or want to contact us on a day-to-day -day basis on that, um, please, uh, please feel free to, to do that. We also have a, a number of other folks who are very much involved in this whole business of connecting producers and, and consumers. So the Council on Food Policy is an idea that's been around for a while. Uh, there was a council that dealt with these, some of these kinds of issues um, during the Cuomo administration, and then, uh, but it was not in law or whatever. There were a number of proposals to create uh, a council by the legislature we took a look at those when we first uh, came into office and just said, you know, this topic is, is right. I think the idea of how do you uh, broaden the discussion about local food and nutrition and food availability to people is the right thing to do. And so how do we do it right within the, the constraints that we have as, um, as an agency? It's sort of hard to understand how things work until you work on that inside and you realize how much time it takes to be compliant with various uh, mandates, although if there's any county government officials here, you may be familiar with that. Uh, so what we did was we said, rather than wait for the legislature to act, why don't we proceed with creating a council that we think is something that will be agile enough to hopefully uh, get things done, at least from, a, uh, from an executive standpoint. And so uh, a number of goals and, and directives were set out in that executive order, uh, but this really captures what, what it is that that we were after there. So why do you uh, create something like this? Well, first of all, everybody understood, and certainly at the time, uh, Governor Spitzer was very interested um, in agriculture. <clears throat> and uh, it's a very, very important industry here in the state of New York. 4.5 uh, billion at the farm gate, 25 billion when you fold in things uh, moving downstream from there. Seven and a half million acres, 25% of the state's land area. It's just, it's just a big business in uh, any way that, that you cut it. Uh, all that said, um, tough times, dealing in wholesale commodities, et cetera, et cetera, number of farms decreasing, uh, there are increased business costs, lots of labor issues. 
uh, and, it, and it just does threaten it. And there's just a lot of concerns that people have. Um, also, at the same time all that's going on sort of at the farm, we have the 11th highest poverty rate uh, in the U.S. 2.76 million people. That's more than I think all the Rocky Mountain states put together are living in poverty here in New York State. One in five low-income households buys no fruits or vegetables on a weekly basis. Think about that number and think about what we do well historically here on the farm side. That is really quite incredible. Food banks, emergency feeding programs, record numbers of requests. It is just shameful, but there are many, many people who don't know where their next meal is coming from here in the state of New York. Research supports the link between this food insecurity and then health, nutrition, and children's development. I'll show you a few of those slides here in a few minutes. One of the things we did as a council was take a look at some of the food infrastructure things. Now, some of you in agriculture are gonna think some of this is a stretch, but what I want you to do this morning and over time is think about this council. And we need to stop thinking about ourselves in, in agriculture as the producer, the input person, the banker, the researcher, the extension people. We have a whole other bunch of people who want to see all of us collectively succeed. You're tapping into it in the Hudson Valley. You see that people want agriculture to succeed. And there are things like infrastructure here that we can do and lots of other things along the way. But we walked through, I walked through Harlem uh, last summer, and you can see these shuttered grocery stores all around. A widespread shortage of neighborhood grocery, grocery stores uh, does exist in, in the city of New York. Low-income neighborhoods have the biggest need. We can show, I'll show you some slides on that. And uh, so, you all, so you have a situation where you can't even, if we produce it, you can't even get it to people that need it. They're buying you know, a Mountain Dew and a bag of tortilla chips uh, at the pharmacies, the convenience stores, and so on and so forth. And you know, we all know that, that is not where all the rest of us are shopping for food. So if you take a look at, at this, um, these slides here are the, um, the percent of people who report no fruit or vegetables the previous day. Now you take a look at those neighborhoods. For those of you from out of town, that's New York City, Staten Island down to the left, uh, Harlem, the Bronx up in the right, and then you have some very uh, other um, low-income neighborhoods there on the east side of, of Queens and in, and in Kings County. And so if you start to take a look at, and we'll, I'm going to talk after these slides, you'll see who is, who's all involved in this. But when you get into uh, fruits, vegetables, three times or more a day. Look at those figures, 42% less likely to die of stroke, et cetera, et cetera. These are the, these are the kinds of things that, that all of us know. And I think many of us uh, with an agricultural background who you know, who know what to do with a bag of squash or a bag of potatoes, um, th this is sort of foreign to us that these kind of statistics um, exist. We've all heard that obviously eating more of these fruits vegetables and so on is very beneficial to our health. And you can, yet you can see massive millions of people are represented in those, um, in those areas with red uh, neighborhoods. So it comes as no surprise when you more or less look at the dark blue, that is where uh, the obesity rates are also the highest. And then the large red circles represent uh, where diabetes is the highest. And so you start to get this connection that's been brewing here as we do this work at the Council on Food Policy about the connection between what it is that we're doing and we're growing and we're producing. Uh, and this fits with dairy as well, uh, very well. Uh, with the problems that many uh, nutritionists uh, feel exist in our society. And, and so there's, there's the data that shows that correlation. Um, given that, we have a very active uh, promotion uh, and uh, uh, economic development office in New York City that, uh, that is uh, headed by uh, Bob Lewis. Uh, all of you uh, in, the f in the fruit and vegetable industry, you may, have, um, you may know him directly. If not, uh, if you're ever down in that world, he's the blur in the room. Uh, Bob is a tremendously energetic man. In fact, I promoted him shortly after I came here to be a special assistant um, reporting uh, directly into the front office with us. He has some very uh, competent staff there. 
uh, we have people based in Albany, um, Bill Kimball and, and Steve McGratton, but also in the city, Christina Grace, and all of these people are working with Ann and Jerry Cosgrove, the deputy who heads up that area. So uh, there is a real willingness to try to see what we can do well beyond outside of agriculture in the fact that we want to sell more fruits and vegetables that are grown here in New York. Um, so we're trying lots of different things, and these are just some of the things that uh, they are occurring statewide, but so much of what occurs is uh, leadership for these kinds of things is, uh, is occurring in the city. On-site nutrition education provided under Farmer's Market Nutrition Program. Um, Cornell Cooperative Extension has been just uh, incredible in this whole process, and I, I just really see if there is uh, to be a real um, close on this going forward. I really see extension as being the critical link. Uh, it, it always has been between nutrition education um, and agriculture. But uh, you know, what do you do with a Hubbard squash? <laughs> uh, you could fight off an attacker, I suppose, but most people don't know what the hell to do with one of those things. You know, and and this is very very uh, fundamental, and all, all the rest of us know. But the truth of the matter is that you really got to get out there and show people. People don't know how to cook anymore. They can rip open a bag of chips. They cannot cook squash. It's amazing. And so these kinds of programs are, are terrific. We've got healthy recipes out there. They're slightly better than the boiling of the squash, which we do at home. Uh, uh, and, and working in neighborhoods, and that is um, a huge advantage. Different topic for a different day, but uh, the the demand for interesting uh, ethnic products that we have in this state is incredible, and I think there's a great deal more work that we can do in that whole area in general. Uh, enhancing the Women, Infants, and Children program at Farmer's Market where fresh produce is sold, no question about this is a, a big area of focus. WIC participants uh, here in the city, Farmer's Market participating. Uh, one of 92 New York City Department of Health clinics. So another relationship that we've built in this whole process is working with the New York City uh, Department of Health and talking regularly to, to Dr. Frieden. Very interesting new thing that I think we can credit solely Bob Lewis with was the facilitation of transportation of people getting these products. Uh, we've all been to New York City. It's not that easy to get around. And it's a lot less easy to get around when you've got bags of groceries. So it turns out a lot of these school buses are available midday, and Bob has, uh, is working with various foundations, um, but he's taking people uh, senior, from senior centers in low-income neighborhoods, and they, they're putting them on these buses midday and, um, and bringing people into markets to purchase things that there's no way otherwise they could do in any kind of a practical way. And of course, you know, obviously teaching about uh, food and agriculture. Uh, a lot of interesting groups down there who are working very hard on this that honestly most of you have never heard of and that's what we need to do. We need to get more people who are producing with more of these groups. Uh, the Council on the Environment running the uh, the green market systems. There's their Learn It, Grow It, Eat It program. They're learning about New York agriculture, producing vegetable crops there in their school gardens, and then healthy nutritional practices. It's all, these things are all very much um, integrated. Uh, obviously, another big area that we do through our Pride in New York program and, and our uh, economic development folks there, working with wholesalers. Uh, my friend Larry Eckhart is quick to remind everybody that, you know, we're not going to feed the world out of the back of a pickup truck. We're going to feed some of the world out of the back of a pickup truck. But the truth of the matter is there's a, there are millions and millions of people in the city. And if we're going to be effective, we have to have the supermarkets at the end we have to have good sound uh, distribution points in between. We need, uh, desperately, I think, need a uh, dramatic rebuild of the Hunts Point Terminal Market. Uh, and so we work with wholesalers. The truth of the matter is that where our largest uh, areas of, of, of fruit and vegetable production exist are a long way from the city, even if that's the Hudson Valley, going with a distributor to move, to move milk in the city. Um, so uh, we work carefully with the associations, Jim Allen. Uh, obviously, we do move in, you know, through the great work that the New York Apple Association does. We worked with them uh, on package design, on, on branding, uh, Pride in New York, Apple's there, and they've got a great relationship uh, in that market. But as markets change around the state, we're trying to help introduce people. It's sort of, if you, you know, 
if you've never done business in New York, it just seems like a completely foreign uh, area and a foreign concept and a very difficult thing to get your, your arms around. And um, that's been the case with Eden Valley growers who have always worked selling most of their uh, produce in, in western New York, but they were looking to you know mitigate their risk and see what other opportunities exist for them. So we're happy to um, we were happy to set up a meeting with them. Uh, we know the people at the market well, and we like to think we know most of the growers well. So we're we're constantly trying to do this. And you know, frankly, um, as I look at the uh, at the budget coming up here this this coming year, I, I just see a lot more of this uh, is, is is the kind of thing that we're going to be able to do. Uh, we are in precipitously bad uh, financial times as a state, but we're maintaining our core of staff. So I don't, I, it's not clear to me at all today how many billboards or radio advertising, what we can do for the Pride of New York. But what we can do is this sort of hand-to-hand -hand, uh, sales work. Maybe what we need to do is bring a bunch of tractor salesmen in and we'll just get them on the road. Because I think that's really what it's going to come down to, is helping in these large, large sales. Cooperating with major food retailers, and in fact, you see this um, banner here. It's, it's part of the things that, uh, that I think we have to do with the Pride of New York program is how do we partner with, with regional efforts. If the identity you know, is going to be Long Island, then, then let's partner with that grow, Grown in Long, Long Island th uh, uh, logo. And that may be the case in the Valley, it may be the case in the Finger Lakes or Northern New York, whatever. But um, there's um, increasingly efforts like uh, Senator Schumer and Long Island Farm Bureau just recently announced this increase of purchase of products there from the island. It's again the same theme that we've heard about this morning. It's, it's a remarkably different time. Uh, so we're going to be dealing with, uh, and we have been dealing with all of these integrated uh, issues of um, ag economic development, uh, food insecurity, and nutrition, and continuing to try to bring them uh, all together. So who is this? Uh, there are 21 members appointed by the governor. And uh, since it was our idea, I got to be the chair. <laughs> uh, and that's partly offense, because I know what this industry is capable of. And of course, it's partly defense, that I don't want our farmers to be uh, run over with, you know, uh, with things that are unrealistic and, and not possible for us to take advantage of. There are uh, members from seven state agencies, Ag and Markets, the Health Department, the Education Department, Aging. Uh, OTDA, temp which is Temporary and Disability Assistance, the Consumer Protection Board, and Economic Development. Now, um, all of the people that you see listed there, uh, <laughs> we did get the Dean of the College of Ag and Life Sciences on. <laughs> uh, Susan may be regretting that to this very day as she was getting her background check done and they were looking for her marriage license. I don't even know where my own marriage license is, she said. This business of public service can be a, a, a little bit draining. <laughs> we talked her off the ledge. She's on the team. We're glad to have her there, no question about it. Um, farm organizations, the food industry. So you start to see that uh, there's a lot of cooperation on putting New York agriculture on a pedestal here. And it, and it really is. I think the challenge for us in the administration, and, and, and I take it as the chair, and that is communicating the good work that's being done here and the um, expectation that we will grow more carrots, that we will grow more apples, that we will put more milk in New York City schools. Uh, we have to balance that with other state agencies and, and, and we have to explain to them this, this uh, priority.